Working on our platformer game, one of the features that seems to be happening is people want to have the artwork be able to flip back and forth, left and right. And while we can do flips through code, and in certain instances with certain characters, you know, that certainly is going to work, but sometimes your character may be, say, holding something in their left hand. And if you just take and flip your artwork, now suddenly they were carrying their sword first in their left hand, now it's in their right hand. And we'd have some continuity issues, so that might not be the best solution. So sometimes what's better is to actually have separate graphics of or images for each movement cycle. So you have a movement cycle for going left, a movement cycle for going right, and if you have additional movement or animation cycles that you need, each one of these is separate. So while we can transform things with code, sometimes the more straightforward solution is to do it with artwork. So if I look at the artwork that I have going in the platform game, previously I had my six unicorn images and now I have an additional six unicorn images that are flipped in the other direction. So this artwork that I have, one through six and seven through 12, I just took the original six that I had because I didn't possess the original flash animation file and I just opened each one up in Photoshop, flipped it and saved it out in its flip configuration. But if it was a asymmetrical image so that I needed to balance out you know, left hand versus right hand or something like that, that would have been the time to then custom paint and tweak each layer of my animation. So if I were doing that, that'd be great. In this case, I just needed my artwork flipped so that I'm going to then be able to call the correct frames with code. Now what's important to notice is we have frames one through six are running to the right, seven through 12 are running to the left. So that is important to keep in mind is those numbers because then they get reflected inside our code. Now, instead of loading six frames like I did previously with the unicorn, now I load 12 because I have 12 frames of artwork for my unicorn. So I've changed it up a little bit. I'm doing 12 instead of six so that it loads all 12 pieces of artwork. Now inside the unicorn, we'll notice that there's not a lot of stuff going on in reference to which way it's showing until I move into its display method. Inside the display method here for the unicorn, I'm drawing this rectangle box just so we can see what is the area that the unicorn, unicorn occupies. So I draw a box at x, y width and height. But what I will notice is I have this value here facing right. If we think back and remember images 7 through 12 the unicorn is facing left. Images 1 through 6 the unicorn is facing to the right. So knowing that we're going to see that when the unicorn is facing to the right, I will be using my current frame as I used it prior. Because if I go back to the previous non-platformer version of the unicorn, the unicorn animated with image sprite image current frame X, and now I modified the Y plus three here so that the unicorn appeared to be standing on the platforms. So it just shifted his artwork down a little bit. That's what the plus three is because otherwise without that plus three in here, the unicorn seems like he's almost hovering just off the ground. So the plus three was just to move it down because my artwork was drawn so sloppy and crappy that it didn't really lend itself. You know, so now I'm having to cover for the fact that I was lazy when the artwork was drawn. And now I have to fix that with code. I should have just made better artwork, but that's how it worked out that day. I think it's even a mouse artwork drawn unicorn. I didn't even use the tablet, which is why it's so ugly to begin with. So that's the plus three. So just if your artwork is lined up, you don't need it. But if I get rid of the threes in here, well, just so that we can see what that three is doing. When the unicorn comes up, you'll see that he hovers just off of the ground. 
So when he runs, he's now running off of the ground. And if I change that now, and three was just a guess that I tried and it was good enough that then once I did that, I didn't feel like he was floating anymore, but was more settled on the ground. And we can see I could probably even go down one more. Four might even be better because I see a little bit of green showing through under his foot right there. So it might be better if I went down a little bit more and I could even go with the four and maybe that's going to be better. So change those to four. And now it looks like he's actually standing on the platform and running on the platform, though a super strong tail does keep him up on the platform nicely. So yeah, four is probably better than three, so go with four. But your artwork, if your artwork is drawn correctly, so it actually is flush on the bottom, then you're good. You don't need to do that. But if you're sloppy and need to adapt for your artwork, you may need to make a change if you want it to blend in properly. Now, the only difference we can see is if he's facing right, I say, well, current frame is going to be zero through five. But if he is not facing right, then he's facing to the left, I add six to that. So now I grab out of my picture array, remembering that the frames are one through 12 based on file numbers, but when they're stored in the array, it's 0 through 11. So current frame starts out at 0, and it counted 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That gives me six values for my unicorn for each direction. So then I add a 6 into it, so it's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then plus 6. So then when I'm facing to the left, it just increases current frame by six so it just shifts it over so it grabs the other six images so it ended up being i tried a bunch of different ways of doing this where i took if facing right and i kept doing different things and i couldn't come up with anything that didn't want to break the code where i kept getting the out of index exception errors where i current frame ended up being too big and then finally it's like oh all i need to do is just shift it when he's facing left and shift it by six because that's the difference between facing right and facing left, is just the numbers that we're trying to access in that array are six over. So if I have my 12 images of my unicorn, where the first six he faces to the right, the second six he faces to the left. So if current frame goes zero, one, two, three, four, five, and then it resets, zero, one, two, three, four, five, zero, one, two, three, four, five, that's what current frame does. When I'm facing to the left, I just shifted over by six. So zero, one, two, three, four, five. Well, zero plus six means I'm now over here. Here, 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 so then I get these. Now, oh wait, I'm facing back in the other direction. Well, then I don't add six, so now current frame is gonna grab out of this chunk of frames. So it ends up grabbing out of one or the other based on the shift of six, looking in Sublime where we can see here that when I'm facing left, I can just put even a comment, facing left, I shift it over by six, so it now grabs the these six when I'm facing to the left, it grabs these six when I'm facing to the right. So if I'm facing to the right, current frame is only going to be zero, one, two, three, four, five. Now, I've modified because my total number of frames was 12, and I used that when I loaded the beginning of my document. So I have frames and I said it's 12 because I loaded those 12 unicorns. Frames is 12. But inside my unicorn class, somewhere in here, the frame sequence or animation sequence, or I, I was struggling for a good name, so that's the name that popped into my head at that point when on about my fourth try of figuring out an elegant solution for this. That's where I said, well, the animation sequence is six frames long. So I could reuse the same logic if every sequence, what the movement, whether it's running, jumping, breathing, you know, every sequence, if it's six frames long, then I can just reuse that number. Otherwise, I just need a new variable. So frame sequence is six, and that's how it now knows under that update 
or and before I had a variable, I even hard coded it in. I had six there. Because then that way I knew it's like, okay, I only want to go through six frames. And this now gives me zero through five, which means current frame will be zero through five, or it's going to be six through eleven. And that gives me my six frames that we are working with. Previously, when our creatures, characters, or whatever they are, move around on screen and we watch them. We've been able to run off the screen. But now, I hit the bottom, I can't go off the screen. And if I hit the wall, right now there's a bounce effect turned on. So if I hit the wall, I bounce. And what bounce does is it reverses your kind of movement vector so that you're not moving in the same direction anymore, but that you bounce off that object. Now, to do that, what we need to do and to figure out with that is how do we get those boundaries? How do we get those barriers that stop us from moving off screen? And currently, you know, it's checking for the top, but there's no way we can reach the top in this current iteration of the game. But that's going to be a little bit different than in Platformer 2, because in Platformer 2, I can actually run off the screen. And then I do the little asteroids wrap back onto the other side. I can even bounce off the top. Now, when we look at that, what's happening is we have a check boundaries function. And now check boundaries is part of the player, or in this case, the unicorn class. And inside the main draw function, it's going to, oh, I don't want to be looking at this one. Let's look at this one. This one doesn't have as much crap. This one's cleaner right now because it, it's not launching an array of bullets, so that cuts it down. There's only one bullet you can fire. But what happens is we update the unicorn, and then we check for collisions with the platform, and then we uh, update based on that information, and then we check to see if we hit one of the walls. And if we hit one of the walls, then what needs to happen? And then we update the bullet, and then if the bullet needs updating, then we fire. If the bullet's going to fire, then we display the unicorn, display the platform, display the bullet. Uh, this display position data, this was sending some information because um, of how some math calculations were working inside processing. When I was trying to do these lines and figure out what is the distance between my two objects, the platform and the unicorn, I was getting some weird results because if I take a number and if I add a number, then I subtract a number and then I add a number, you know, I would think that it would just be simple arithmetic, but apparently processing was giving me some really weird numbers that were preventing it from actually working properly. So it required an extra a couple sets of parentheses that I wasn't anticipating and it wasn't until I looked at those numbers that it's like wait a second these numbers are not the numbers I need so what I did instead of logging information out using the print line command so it shows up in the console I actually wrote the information so it shows up on screen so if you've been paying attention you'll see that there's information on screen about where is the center of my unicorn versus the center of my platform DX and where is the center of the on both Y so we have our left and right centering and our Y so you can see how we change those values as it moves up and down and then we're calculating what is the combined half widths and combined half heights which is part of our kind of platform collision information that we need to keep track of. So I wrote all that stuff on screen just so I could find out what, what was the computer thinking versus what I needed it to think. And I realized in the beginning I wasn't getting the right answer. Because there's sometimes you'll write something and it makes, you're like, no, yeah, this makes sense, it should work. And then you're finding out that the computer's not behaving properly. So a common thing we do is we use the print line command to send a message to ourselves. But when you're getting too much data where that's such a scrolling list of things flying by and you can't read what's happening fast enough, it's sometimes easier to actually write it to a text field on screen. So that can be a useful debugging technique when it's not, when you're working with it. 
If we don't want to see it, we can just comment that out, goes away, no big deal, world's a happy place, move on. All right, so when we're gonna look at check boundaries before we get into collisions with our platforms, just because boundary checking is a little bit easier. So inside our unicorn class, we can see where it says, hey, if my, my x value is less than zero, it's currently bouncing off the wall. But if we don't want to bounce, if we're less than zero, well, maybe we want to move further off screen and we'll figure out a number to make that happen in just a second. Or if we find out that our x, and x is measured where the x is the top left corner. That's what we're looking at in our object, is that top left corner. What is its value? So the x of that corner plus the width of the object is that greater than the width, meaning I've gone off screen. And if that's the case, then we bounce it back off the wall here. But if we turn these off, we'll start out with that and see what happens. And this is where, when we're doing things, we want to go one step at a time. So now I can, oh look, he can go hide off screen because he's a shy unicorn, even if he you know, does know how to shoot laser beams. But see, now he can go off screen. Now, what we could do is figure out, okay, well, if he can go off screen, I'm first gonna take care of this one, sort of. And if I say x is zero, we can now see how he reappears. But notice the moment he goes a pixel off screen, he bopped over, and you may be going, nah, that's not right. That's not good. So maybe we have to say, instead of having the width here, is say, if x is greater than width. Now let's see what that does. So now if I go here, and go, we can see how he can start creeping off screen. And then he reappears, okay. That works. That works in that direction, sort of, except he's, he probably should show up, not at zero, but at a negative width value. So it now puts it off screen. So now if I go to the right here, off, 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 and now he reappears. So you may notice how suddenly that looks a little smoother here. So it's now a more seamless asteroid wrap that he doesn't reappear at the next side until he's all the way off and then he immediately reappears. So now if he goes too far, so instead of x being less than zero, x is, if x is greater than negative width, then what we need to do is set x equal to width here. And by this simple change, and see what happens. You can stick his nose off screen to, you know, he, he's a little afraid here. He's a little shy, just want to go, oh, he, he's afraid to disappear, because what happens if he goes in the void and doesn't come back? You know, that would be a tragic moment. Okay, good. He didn't disappear. And now he can perfectly screen wrap. So once he disappears, then he's allowed to reappear on the other side. Working with the platforms, what we end up doing is we need to figure out how our object is going to be interacting with the platforms and how a collision may be occurring. Now if I look at my main draw function here, so the main draw function you know, refreshes the background, now it's going to tell my unicorn to update and then it will check to find out has the unicorn collided with the platform. That function is going to set some values on unicorn if something has happened and then we're going to respond to those values under check platform so if we need to make adjustments because what's happening is 
if I have my player and if I have my platform, we need to find out have I collided from the bottom? Have I collided from the top? My right edge, my left edge, where's that occurring? But now if my player is moving and if my next frame of movement puts me here, well, we can see that that would be problematic because the two objects are intersecting. So when a collision with a platform occurs, what we need to do is we need to recognize that's occurred and then say, before I show it to you on screen, I need to remove that overlap so the two objects aren't on top of each other anymore. So this very technique of determining if a collision has occurred and if so, how to offset it so the objects are adjacent but not overlapping is used not only on platforms but if we were to build a game that had maze walls. So we had a series of walls that you had to stay within that confine. We could now use the same technique to prevent characters from getting lost inside the walls. Because if your movement takes you through or onto something and we recognize, well, no, that's not right, then we need to back you up so you can't pass through walls or pat and get stuck on top of them. Because we don't want our unicorn to be, you know, kind of riding in the middle of a platform because, well, that'd be bad. So we need to figure out how to prevent that overlap and push it back. So that's what we're going to look at doing with these different functions here. So we've identified and figured out check boundaries there. Now, as we look at this, the B refers to the bullet, U is unicorn, P is for our platform. There's currently one platform, one bullet, and one unicorn in platformer uh, file. In platformer two, we have an array of bullets and multiple platforms that we're working with. So it changes things up a little bit, but not a lot. Now when I press the keys, we can see how the keys make movements happen, the same as we had before, key pressed, left, right, up, down, space, and shift, left, right, up, down, space, and shift, unreleased. So that was just copy pasted from the previous keyboard project because it's good to go. We don't need to change anything. So that's one of the things that as you work, you'll realize you can recycle bits and pieces from projects. In the one that shoots multiple bullets, I went and copied the timer directly out of the catcher game and dumped that into it as well because we just needed a basic timer. So going back to Mr. Unicorn here, Mr. Unicorn's update says, hey, if I push the left key, then I'm going to have a negative acceleration in the X direction, and friction is going to be one, so there is no friction while I'm moving left. It's only when I'm not pressing the keys will I modify my velocity, my speed, by friction to make the character slow down. Because if you play the game, you realize where there's almost a little bit of slipping as the unicorn runs, and then you stop pressing the keys, it slows down. That adds some realism into what we're doing. Now, if you take friction and put it as when we're not pressing one of the keys and we make it much lower than 0.96, if you do something like 0.3, then instead of seeming to be on a slippery surface, we'll see that when I run, it stops almost immediately. So I can run and jump, stop. I don't find that to be as engaging. It just doesn't feel as natural. So 0.3 doesn't seem to be a real good amount for modifying the friction. So the 0.96, now if I did 0.99, well, get rid of that extra point. And did that, what we'll find is the character takes a lot longer to slow down Whoa, yeah, pretty much, he's slowing down, but it's like he's on ice. Yeah. It's real slippery. So 
how you tweak and play with those 0 0.96 to 0.99, that's a pretty small mathematical change. But what's happening is when I'm not pressing one of the keys, if I'm not pressing left or right, because left and right make friction back to one so it doesn't slow down when he's airborne. It makes sense. When you're in the air, you only have air friction. That's not a lot. But when you're on the ground, we want that friction to slow down the character's movement. And when we look at that, we can see that if we're on the ground, then we multiply our horizontal or our x speed by friction. So if we take a number and multiply it by less than one, the number gets smaller. And then we multiply that smaller number by a number less than one. And we're doing this 60 times a second. So that's why 0.96 makes our number shrink down really, really, really fast. Because it just grinds it down. So as soon as I stop moving, you just see that number just tank. And when friction is, say, 0.5, if we just use 0.5, because then I can do the math in my head really easy, and our velocity was 5, well, the next frame, our velocity becomes 2.5. Then it becomes 1.25. So you can see how it just keeps having if our friction was 0.5. So that would slow it down super fast. In the matter of a few frames, our velocity would be dead stopped, which is why the 0.3 just made, as soon as you stop pushing the key, er, brakes are on. So when we play with friction, that adds just some liveliness into the code that we're working with. So we have an acceleration x, acceleration y, gravity, and friction. These are things we're keeping track of. Facing right is just so we can keep track of whether I'm facing to the right or left. So when I push those keys, then our uh, display method will know, hey, if you're facing right, it knows which artwork to show. So then we know appropriately. Now, if you push up or down in your game, Furious uses up or down, and you have another set of graphics, then you could now say facing up, facing down. So you'd have additional values or booleans that you could keep track of. Now you could use booleans or you could use where facing direction or call it something like that and assign a string to it. Now you, there's lots of ways we can go about solving that. Um, I like the booleans because either you're facing right or you're not, you're facing up or you're not. I mean, if you're not facing up, you're going down. If you're not going, you know, so you, you can figure out what works in your directions. Uh, let's see. So one thing that we do is we update the player because then we determine if it collided with a platform because if that movement is going to put us into a platform, we want to move then figure out if we overlapped with a platform. If we overlap with a platform, then we undo enough of the movement so we're no longer overlapping. That's the sequence of events. So we start out, we move. Then we go, hey, look, I overlapped a platform. Well, how much did I overlap the platform by? OK, that much. So I'm going to undo just that portion of my move. Then we're no longer overlapping. That's what's going to happen when we check against the platforms. But first, we just figure out what is our movement with update. So we move left, we move right, and if I'm not pressing left or right, in a, or if I'm pressing them both, then I want to just kill the movement input. That's what happens here. Now I'm going to change. I want to just make so it's like the other one. I like up instead of space for jumping. That just makes me happier because then I can just play with one hand instead of two hands. So now if I press the up key and I'm on the ground, the unicorn starts out, he's not on the ground. If I collide with a platform, then I will be able to be on the ground. Because if I collide on the bottom, on ground becomes true. And if I'm on the ground, then I'm allowed to jump again. So I change my Y velocity by jump force. And then I say I'm no longer on the ground and I make sure friction is one. So then when I'm in the air, I can go wee and fly like a bird. A very happy unicorn because he can fly. He's got a lot of jump to him too. Now all of these values, if you take and Franken code with what's been provided here and you start putting this into years and you're like, wow, I'm jumping too high or it's running too fast or it's running too slow. 
change the numbers. This is about, you change the knobs and dials so you get the right feel for your game. If you have artwork that needs to be slow and sluggish, you need to change the value so it's slow and sluggish. If you have artwork that should be fast and responsive, you need to change your artwork so that it's fast and responsive. Now, when we look at this, we end up having some values of my acceleration, sometimes we call it speed x, but because of how we're using this now, uh, acceleration is a more appropriate term. Friction and gravity are self-explanatory. And then Vx and Vy are going to be my velocity in the x direction, velocity in the y direction. That's what they would stand for. Because the next real way to do this is instead of using values like this, we actually use what are called vectors. And vectors are a way of storing two pieces of information in a single value. So Vx, if it was a vector, would have both um, my angle of movement and it could also have my velocity. So I have a velocity vector so I can have angle and magnitude of how fast am I moving, what direction am I moving in, then I can have a position vector which stores x and y and then it becomes really easy to add, multiply, subtract. Then we can have a gravity vector, a wind vector. I and mean, you can have all these different vectors and then you add them together and there's cool vector math that makes it happen. But we're not going there this semester. That's something that we would only do if we did more advanced game programming. But vectors are fun. So if I'm on the ground, I have friction. Now we take our, every frame, we take our y vector and we add gravity to it. Gravity is always present. But if we happen to be standing on the ground later, where we're standing on the platform of the ground, then we apply a negative gravity to counteract that gravity. But we'll see how that works in a little while. Now if my x value is greater than my speed limit, I set it equal to my speed limit. In this case it's 5. My y values can always go up to twice my speed limit. Now if I don't like that, I can certainly you know, change that 2 to something else, 1.5, 4, whatever I want it to be. How high do I want him to jump? And if he's moving too slow, well then we set the speed limit higher for the character. So this is part of you modify these values and go, oh, what happens? Now what if I set a speed limit to 10, to 12? Well, then you're going to get some real, you know, he's a high-speed unicorn at that point. If he's super pokey, maybe I set a speed to 2, so it's even more pathetic. And then we watch how we can run now. So now it's like, come on, Bessie, you can do it. Which, with the way his legs are moving, it almost, you know, works better that he is going so slow. But you can see that... We need to make some adjustments because now, based on my changing that speed, that also is affecting his ability to fall down. Actually, let's leave that at two. And then change this um, to a higher amount so now he can actually start falling a little bit faster. So he still runs slow, but, and then now if he's jumping too high, we can always modify jump force, but if I do that, he won't reach the platform. So I've got to be careful about, because he's barely, I'd have to make the platform closer for him to get onto it. But I, I think that his speed of two fits with the animation style that we see with the unicorn going on on screen. Changing numbers around gives you a personalized, a customized experience with the same code. So if every one of you puts in new numbers and new artwork, yours feels unique and personal to yours. It's no longer tied to, oh, it's just a copy of what we have going here. The final thing we do in update is apply our x and y velocity vectors to my x and y position of the player with the v plus equals vx, y plus equals vy. Doing that moves the player. And then our next thing is we will check to find out has the player actually overlapped a platform. Now, if the player overlaps the platform, then we are going to 
need to know how to kill its velocity here. But when that overlap is occurring, we undo that overlap inside the rectangle collision function, which in this case is taking two rectangle shaped objects, my unicorn and my platform. So currently, objects that we're going to work with, if I look at the unicorn, it's, I'm going to check it versus a platform. And when I look at a platform, a platform, platform has width height x, y, half width, half height. I added this type of property in because when I was adding the platforms, I thought, well, it'd be kind of cool if you had platforms that were dangerous. So they would be platforms you have to avoid and you could check for that. So you could compare when you collide with the platform, is it a evil platform or a bad platform? Say it's fire or spikes or something. So then if you run into it, you lose health or die. So that, that was just kind of my thinking of why I added that property into a platform. But otherwise, just like the unicorn, the platform has x, y, width, height, half width, half height. And then we cal calculate and use those values when we are checking for interaction because we have those values on the unicorn, but then the unicorn has all of its different movement values. And then it has current frame that it needs, facing right and frame sequence that it needs. But it has this one property we'll be looking at here, which is collision side. Collision side is what side of our unicorn has hit the platform. Top, right, bottom, left. We need to know or we're in trouble. TRBL which if you ever specify um, position information and borders and things like that in CSS, it's uh, top right, bottom left, margins and padding. So that's the order it goes TRBL, top right, bottom left. So we need to know that collision side. Now, figuring it out with rectangle collisions, I pass in two objects, assuming they're both rectangles. In our catcher game, we use circle-based collision detection this is rectangle-based collision detection. We looked at one algorithm for it last week, but this now needs to be more precise because last week allowed, once they were intersecting, we let stuff happen. Here, if they intersect, we have to know they're intersecting and figure out by how much they're intersecting and then undo the overlap. So when they're intersecting, we need to, once they're intersecting, we have to know how much they're intersecting and then back it off by that overlap amount so that before we issue the display command, the object has been repositioned. So then when we see it on screen, it never is inside the other object. Otherwise, that's just weird. And we don't want that. Now, the first thing we do is we need to find out the half widths of our two objects combined. And then we need to know the distance between the x and distance between the y of each object. And then we're going to compare and find out, because if the distance between their x's and the distance between their y's, well, or if the distance between the x's is less than half of their width. So if we look at an object here, there is an x, there is an x, and these objects clearly are not overlapping on the x-axis. But, so we have this, there's an x, there's an x value for these two objects. So we can see these two lines represent that. So the distance between those two points is less than half of the width of this object and half of the width of this other object. So on the x-axis, these objects are overlapping, which actually we can figure out that combined approximate. I'm going to just draw a box to be approximate half width here. That's pretty close. So this box represents the half width of my two objects. Because this now tells me this object is here. If we combine those two widths, they're not touching. But if the distance between, 
axis is less than this distance, we can see how now it overlaps. So this, this box here represents the sum of their two widths. So now if we put half of this object here, half of this object here, they're not overlapping. But if that distance between those axes shrinks, we know that a collision could be occurring or not. So we first check the distance between their centers, so x plus half their width, versus the combined half widths. Because if that's not true, we're done. No collision happened. But if they are overlapping on the x-axis, then we do the same thing on the y-axis. And if they overlap on both the x and the y-axis, so let's see if we do draw one more box to represent my y's. So here is the distance between the objects on the y-axis. So if we put that middle, middle, they're not overlapping because they're overlapping on the y-axis but not the x-axis. So if I line that up, it doesn't reach the center of that object. So it, it's a little magic trick of comparing distance between center points versus half the width and half the height. And this method of thing, if you ever want to Google it, what you are looking for is rectangle rectangle half width collision detection. And you can find samples of this in just about any modern language right now. But if we're, once we determine that we've overlapped on X and overlapped on the Y axis, that is like, great. Now we know an intersection has occurred. That's how the magic works. If we're overlapping on X and overlapping on Y, a collision has occurred because otherwise we can overlap on one but not the other and then there's no collision happening. And if no collision is happening, we tell rectangle one, and who is R1 in this instance? Who is R1? Unicorn. It's my unicorn. Because if we remember up at the top, R1 is unicorn, R2 is going to be a platform. So if we're not overlapping on the x-axis, we say collision side is none. If we're not overlapping on the y-axis, but we were on the x-axis, collision is none. Otherwise, the only other possibility is we must somehow be intersecting each other. Because if we're not crossing, if we're crossing on the x and crossing on the y, that means we are intersecting. So we just need to figure out where has that intersection occurred. And then we have to determine our overlap. And we figure out are we overlapping more on the x or more on the y. And the collision is on the axis with the smallest amount of overlap. So if my overlap on X is greater than my overlap on Y, then we have to go, well, are we either going to be overlapping on the top or the bottom? And if that's not the case, then we're overlapping on the X axis. So then we say, are we overlapping on left or on the right? Now there's some print line statements here that I was sending messages out when I was writing this to verify that it was indeed working until it got to be cumbersome that it filled up my console with so much information which is why I switched and started showing just like writing text at the top of the screen so then I didn't just get a long scrolling where it's just scrolling through and scrolling through and I'm like no nah, it's not working very well. But I left those in there as a reminder of sometimes when you are writing out your code and you're wondering it's like am I ever even getting to this statement because when I first wrote wrote this code and it wasn't working I had these four print lines in and the objects would be decidedly overlapping 
and none of them would ever print. So it's like, hmm, something's not right. So I put these statements in, expecting that it should log them out, and I got nothing. And that's when I had to go up and realize that how I had written this line, I needed extra parentheses for processing to do the math correctly. Otherwise, it was totally screwing up and giving me just weird numbers that I probably could have, you know, spent some time and figured out what those numbers were, but instead it was faster to just get it to give me the right numbers. I was academically curious as to, it's like, why is it doing math in that order of operation? That doesn't make sense math-wise. But I was in a hurry, so I just left it. So what it will pass back to the unicorn is it will say, hey, collision side, it tells it what side, and it tells it how to adjust its Y or X position based on how much the two objects were overlapping. So when the objects overlap, it's when the object overlaps the other one, it says back up. So if we're overlapping on the top, so if the object hits on the top, it's overlapping on the top, it says back up your Y by that much. If I'm overlapping on the bottom, so I fell into the floor, it raises me back up. So if I overlap on the bottom, it raises me back up. If I'm sticking my head into it, it pushes me down. If I'm pushing my left side into it, it pushes me off to the right. If I put my right side into it, it pushes me back to the left. So it undoes any type of overlap so the objects will end up touching each other instead of overlapping. So it adjusts for that. And then by knowing left, right, top, and bottom, the unicorn is going to be able to update itself speed-wise. So it says, oh, hey, I'm on the ground. I, if I collide on the bottom, well, I'm going to park myself on the ground and negate gravity so I don't keep falling through objects. If I collide on the top, I'm going to kill my upward velocity so I don't keep trying to go up through an object. If I collide it on the left or right, I'm going to kill my horizontal velocity so if you hit an object you just stop. Now we could put bounce in there the same way we had bounce going on so instead of wandering off the screen we could use a bounce factor that's sometimes kind of fun too. So when you hit the side of the platform you bounce back instead of just falling down. I mean these are all things that we can work with as you see fit in your project. So we update the unicorn so it updates it now checks to find out has it overlapped with an object based on its update. If it has, then under check platforms, which is probably not the best name, I should probably rename that. It's, you know, update because of platforms or something. I don't know. I just couldn't think of a good name. And then it updates itself based on what it receives from the check, the rectangle collision information. And then it, the unicorn checks to see if it ran off screen. Now B is for the bullet. We're not worrying about the bullet right now. And then we tell the unicorn to display and we tell the platform to display. So when we look at this, a lot of this is not you know, that sequence wise. If we update all of our things, then we display our objects because we're doing it in this order so that we're trying to prevent so that if I update and display my object, it's possible that my object is going to be on inside of something. And we don't want that. We don't want to trap our player inside objects. So when we're doing a platform, we need to make it so that if we are inside after the update, our platform check is going to move it back. If we're at the edge of the screen after update or off screen after update, then our check boundaries is going to go, oh look, you were off screen. I'm going to wrap you to the other side. Or you went off screen. I'm going to bounce you back so you're not off screen anymore. So we do those kinds of things to correct for what update does. But the first thing is we move, find out if we've moved into something we're not supposed to be or off screen where we're not supposed to be. And then we use these other functions to correct for that before we call display. Otherwise, we'll call display and then we'll update for it. Well, we update it, but we already landed on something or through something or we're off screen and it's just not good. 
So that is why we do this order of doing all of our updates and then doing our displays. Now, and this just tells the bullet object to fire and then it sends information. It's passing to the bullet the unicorn's X and Y, the width of the unicorn because I was doing some tweaks on things, so don't really need that, but you could. Oh no, we, we do need that so we know when we're going to the left or right and we have to know where we're facing left or right so we can offset the position of the bullet. And then the bullet is able to fire when it needs to. Where the bullet receives that information under fire and then if the bullet's not already firing, then it updates its Y position to the Y of the unicorn, offset so it comes out of the eyeball. Then it sets fire into true. And then if we're facing right, we have to offset a little bit on the X position. And, if, and then we set our velocity in the X direction positive so it goes right. If we're facing left, velocity in the X position is negative, so we'll go left on screen, and then we update it to the X of the unicorn. So then the bullet can come out of the eye of the unicorn, and then if, if that particular bullet is firing, it updates based on its X and Y values, checks to see if it hit, went off screen. If it did, it resets itself. There's reset, making the bullet eligible to be fired again. And then display just does a X, Y width and height. So that's really how the firing works on the bullet. So we can see, wee, bullet shooting, la unicorn shooting laser beams out of its eye. Always a good time.